What is up, guys? Welcome back to a movie podcast here on my channel. I am here with Jamie on Down in Front, and we are going to be talking about a lot of topics. Well, not a lot of topics, a couple of topics today. Uh, Robert Downey Jr. is Dr. Doom. We're going to be talking about our mid-year Oscar predictions. We're going to be talking about what's coming up in, in your local cinema, and then we will cap it off with our review of Deadpool and Wolverine, which just which I just saw has crossed 500 million at the Worldwide Box Office, which is a crazy staff for a radar movie. We'll get into that later. But how are you doing today, Jamie? Mm-hmm. And two and two and two days plus previews. That's insane for any movie. Yeah. I'm doing okay. I'm much better now because we get to record today. It's beautiful. It's uh, nice and breezy in my living room because I have like three different fans on me. Um, you. So <laughs> you doing okay, Corey? How you been? I'm good. I'm good. It's been a long week. Uh, people who follow me on social media and all that know I did lose my dog Phoenix, but obviously cinema and wrestling has been a good escape. For me, to, over the past week, I got I to see Twisters. Yeah, I, I, Sorry, I, brother. I know, man. I, thanks, man. But um, I got to see Twisters this week. I got to see Deadpool and Wolverine this week. So I got to see two really good movies. And then there was a lot of fun wrestling as well. Obviously, anyone who's probably coming here from my social media knows that's where I'm. Me and Jamie both are big wrestling fans as well. So it's been a big week for that as well. Um, but we're. But probably the biggest news of the week in movies and cinema. Hold on, hold on, hold on. You can't bury the lead here. If you feel it. (laughs) I can't. See, now I can't even remember. I can't even remember the punchline. Chase Chase it. Chase it. Chase it. Chase it. I said if you feel it. Great movie. We talked about it a little last week without spoiling it and how it how success how it was a great popcorn movie. I agreed with you completely there. Um very fun movie. We we might talk about that a little later when we're talking about Deadpool and Wolverine, a little bit of comparison, because they're the two biggest movies in the box office right now. Um, but yeah, now we will move on to that big news. Obviously, it's we kind of talked it's about the box office enough next week, last, last week. Last week, but yeah. We're gonna, be, we're gonna keep talking about it again when Robert Downey Jr. breaks box office records because, as Corey alluded to at the start, he is once again back in the MCU. They backed up a truckload of money. He was making upward of fifty million dollars per per movie plus back end deals before he left. And now that this is as performed, he's going to make a lot more than that. So it's going to be interesting to see what his figures are contractually. But he is playing a villain. And no, it will not be Superior Iron Man. He will be wearing, he will be playing a character who never takes a mask off, which kind of interestingly enough limits mm. Robert Downey Jr. How do you feel about this casting court? I see, I get a lot of the criticism for it. I get that. I But there's one thing that I don't agree with. I don't agree that it takes anything away from Tony Stark in the MCU. It doesn't take anything away from his death. It's a different character. He has the same face. It is a different character. They introduced him as Doctor Doom. He is not a Tony Stark variant. As of now, from what we know now, he is not a variant uh, of Tony Stark. He is Doctor Von Doom, which, again, Doctor Doom is a vet. If you're familiar with comics... Doom is one of the big ba- biggest of big bads in the entire Marvel comic universe. It's great to see him part of it be brought into the MCU. I think Robert Downey Jr. proved with Oppenheimer that he has got the range to play a nasty character, a kind of a car- a wolf in sheep's, cl- in sheep's clothing, if you will. So if they do decide to uh, lean into the fact that he is Robert Downey Jr., he is Tony Stark, I think that I think that could have potential for some powerful moments. They could, uh, with the likes of Tom Holland Spider Man, with the likes of uh, Happy, with the likes of Deadpool's going to say something about it. We all know he's going to make a comment about it. Um, but the one thing that I will agree on is I do not like that they've kind of whitewashed the character a little. As people have pointed out, the character is of Romani descent. It sh- I feel like changing that is is a testament to how marvel and disney have worked in recent years i uh, do i think it's a it's a deal breaker for me personally i don't think it is because robert downey jr is such a phenomenal actor that it, it, it's it's a it's pretty much guaranteed that he's going to hit it out of the park regardless uh, but 
I, I'm, I'm not going to really reserve my final judgment until I actually see him playing the character, whether that, that be in a trailer, whether that be in a teaser, the first teaser for uh, Doomsday when it does come out. Um, but yeah, I, 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 and I'm glad to see Robert Downey Jr. back in the MCU. At the end of the day, he was the heart and soul of the Infinity Saga. He was the back. He was the backbone of the entire thing. He was the one with the most cameos. Everything. He is so iconic in a comic book character that one character that the only character and actor that comes close in comic book movies for me is someone we're going to talk about later. Hugh Jackman as Wolverine. It's like it's just their so, their careers are so tied to these characters that it's almost a even bigger risk for Robert Downey Jr. to come back as a different one. But they've established with their multiverse that this is possible. So I, I don't know. I, I really don't really have any strong beliefs either way, other than I'm glad to see Robert Downey Jr. back in the MCU. But you obviously are a massive fan of Robert Downey Jr.'s, Jamie. You've long been a fan of his work, his independent work, his blockbuster work. We talked a little before we even got, in, got started recording that even while he was Tony Stark, he was pumping out some really fun flicks. So what do you think about Robert Downey Jr.'s Doctor Doom and his return to the MCU in general, really? I think that his return makes sense. I don't necessarily think it's going to be an issue. I mean, take Josh Brolin, for example, which mm. big Josh Brolin fan. Josh Brolin was in Deadpool before he played Thanos. Uh, what do Thanos I he Isn't played it? Thanos first, then he played, then he played, yeah. But but I get what you're saying, yeah. yeah. That's dumb because he he was in Deadpool two after the, the big Thanos arc because Deadpool two was 2018. E regardless, I can't mm. believe it. I just said you e regardless instead of regardless. Be that as it may, Josh Brolin is such a different character as Thanos. Because Thanos is designed to not look like Josh Brolin. He's designed to not be Josh Brolin. And I have no qualms about Robert Downey Jr. as Dr. Doom because he wears a mask. Because it, as long as he carries himself different, and anybody who's followed Robert Downey Jr., take Chaplin, for example. Th those mannerisms are not Downey Jr. Those are Charlie mm -hmm. Chaplin's. He does a very good job historically with different roles of changing his mannerisms based on the role. So seeing as it, it there, I, I don't think Robert Downey Jr. will have an issue not being Tony Stark. Uh, no, I will I say I'm very, I under, I'm happy for Downey Jr. Get the money while you can. And of course, Disney need, I'm happy as an MCU fan because for me, Robert Downey Jr. is the MCU. I went from probably apathetically going to see that new Avengers movie to, oh, Downey Jr.'s back. Now I'm interested. The issue I have is we just got back to Downey Jr. being Downey Jr. again. You know what I mean? Yeah. The Louis Strauss, and I'm going to put that out there. Last year's performance as Louis Strauss showed you that Robert Downey Jr., for anybody who had their doubts, because they didn't follow him before Iron Man. Can play complicated villain characters. Absolutely. Of course, Louis Strauss didn't think he was the villain. And Doctor Doom as a character knows he's the villain. And that's a little bit of a di different dynamic. Yeah. But the point stands. I don't think Downey Jr. will have an issue pulling it off. But we just got him back into different kinds of roles again. And I was very excited to see where that went. Because for me, I'm more of when I think of Downey Jr., I don't think of Tony Stark. Hmm. Um, I think if I think of Marvel, I think of Downey Jr. But when I think of Downey Jr., I think of uh, Home for the Holidays, ro ro roles like that. Yeah. Where he's very, kiss, kiss, bang, bang, where he's very a diff just a different. He's synonymous with the one character, but he's so much more than the one character. Yeah. The, the issue I have with the criticisms, Corey. I have one issue with the criticisms because I get it. It's going to be hard for the average person to look at Downey Jr. in the MCU and not think of Iron Man. Mm -hmm. Not to mention, you could have done superior Iron Man. You could have gotten a different actor to be under Doctor Doom. A whole variety of things. It feels like a cheap nostalgia pop. 
to yeah. use wrestling vernacular. I, I get that. My one issue with the criticism is that t- maybe this is because I'm terminally online because it's my job. Yeah. And Twitter's no, not fair. real life. <laughs> yeah. But the a lot of pundits are saying that he's he, uh, he's selling out. He's going back for the money. He's taking the easy paycheck because he doesn't want to put the work in. I saw somebody bump the interview from 2015 where he talked about how independent workers, uh, independent studios exploit their workers. And, and somebody said, he's such an asshole to use quotes. They verbatim what the tweet said, the tweet went viral and said, of course, Robert Downey Jr. hates real cinema because he's never done real cinema and he's not an independent actor. Mm-hmm. Corey, do you know who Robert Downey Sr. is? I don't like that's the thing. I don't know him very well. That's the thing. I know obviously he Robert exists. Robert Downey Sr. So this is gonna be a fun trip into film history. G- gave Robert Downey Jr. his first film role at two years old. Mm-hmm. Robert Downey Jr. grew up on film sets. R- Robert Downey Sr. was the main Manhattan scene underground director, no budget movie director of his time. Mm-hmm. Of the 60s, of the 70s, the New York underground scene that's praised for being for not for making all these movies with absolutely no money at all. Those were the sets Robert Downey Jr. grew up on. Yeah. Not to mention, he started as an independent actor. Home for the Holidays is a big studio movie. Those other than Chaplin, he wasn't getting big studio roles back in the 90s. Then when he went to prison, when he got out. Nobody would hire him. So he did independent roles with no budgets that didn't pay his rent. So he had to go get a role on Alan McBeal just to make rent when he was trying to make it back in movies because he the movies he were working was working on were so low budget he didn't get paid enough. Mm-hmm. When he got Iron Man, he wasn't even the top three highest paid person in the cast. And he was the main character. He was getting paid less than, at least for sure, I know off the for a fact, he was getting paid less than um, Gwyneth Paltrow. And he was getting paid less than Ter- Terrence Howard. I'm assuming he was getting paid less than Jeff Bridges. Jeff oh, Bridges yeah. is not Jeff paid. Bridges is Jeff Bridges, yeah. <laughs> so the idea that Robert Downey Jr. is this studio darling – who never had to work for work to get there and doesn't know what independent cinema, a true independent cinema is, when he is more qualified than anybody else probably in the world to talk about independent cinema. He's an independent actor. He's been, he's been getting that Disney money for 15 years now. But that doesn't change the fact that, a, um, how old is he? He's in his... He's about to be he's nearly 60. 60. Yeah, he's 59. He's 59, yeah. So he's 60 years old. 15 years. He would have been 45 when he got Iron Man. Yeah. And he started acting at two. So he was in, in the independent uh, cinema scene for 43 years, score. And P- P- Twitter started to say he's a big studio actor. Who doesn't, who doesn't know how to work hard, so he has to rely on the Disney check. When, and, and they're getting mad that he talks about how independent studios exploit the workers, when if it was a, con- a big conglomerate or a big studio or a big company doing it, they would be the first one to be angry. But because it it's true art, and you, art has to exist, and art has a purpose, he he's wrong for saying that the the actors who get hired shouldn't have to pay for production. Mm-hmm. Am, I, am I missing something here? I, I I don't think you are. I think it's a. I think and I think a lot of people have just resigned themselves to think because he's been Tony Stark, and it ties all back into the Disney, the Marvel of it all. They think because he is the backbone of that universe. He was sorry. He was the backbone of that universe. He was in. 
so many, even as cameos. He was in, in The Incredible Hulk as an uncredited cameo. That's another thing as well. He was in that movie. He still has not been credited officially with that role. He's never been credited officially. He's in it more than some characters are because he's in at the end of it for about a minute. And like it's crazy to me that people think that Tony, uh, Tony sorry, RDJ is this like arrogant attention whore. As like y- you're kind of saying that without saying it, that's how people are viewing him, and he's an asshole and all this. I just don't see it, and I agree with you. He's a he is very much an independent actor at heart, and he's he's just someone who speaks his mind, and that's yeah. often not the best look in Hollywood. Yeah, but, but he's also. Like this thing that we also talked about beforehand. Just because he was Tony Stark didn't mean that he didn't have other movies going on while he was playing Tony Stark. He had the we talked about Tropic Thunder. We talked about the Judge. We there's Due Date. That was that wasn't great. I'll admit that wasn't great. It was funny, but it wasn't great. Due Date and Do Little, like you said. Sherlock Holmes is his biggest role during the MCU that isn't Iron Man. Exactly. Yep. And those movies are fun. He did like he was he was in a couple of movies that just they didn't really do as well so people kind of just they didn't recognize that they came out and it's kind of i don't know he, it's definitely not a case of that he was just coasting on playing tony stark or anything and then the minute he he was free of tony stark he went and won a best supporting actor like for Oppenheimer or, or did he win it i can't remember he did, he did. win it he, won. he did win it he yeah he should have he should have won an Oscar for Zodiac, but they didn't even nominate him because Hollywood, yeah. he hadn't had the resurgence yet. And yeah, he's just, he's, he is a fantastic actor, but we will transition over to our next topic. I think now, Jamie, we so, will talk about he, your... For someone who won the Oscar last year, we got to yeah. talk about the Oscar this year. Exactly. So... I'm going to let you take the lead for this one. I <laughs> I have not got this part prepared, full disclosure for people. Jamie, on the other hand, does. He's going to take you through his. Well, I will I'm an entertainment writer my... now, professionally, so I got to be up to date on these things. I will have my ones as well. Mine will not be as refined. I might forget a role or forget a movie because I have seen quite a few movies this year, same as Jamie. But, um, yeah, I will take my time and just give you guys mine as well. But, Jamie, take it away with yours. So I'm going to say that some of this is conjecture based on buzz that's going on right now. Uh, not buzz like your the the Toy Story uh, five could win best anime feature in 2026. I'm excited for that. They got uh, Pete Doctor Andrew Stan back, who's a Pixar. Uh, I love I love that series. So I'm always gonna. That, I think last week I was wearing a uh, Rex T-shirt. <laughs> you were, yeah. The uh, so the. This is conjecture based a little bit because a lot of a lot of these movies haven't come out yet, um, and but certain films get festival buzz stuff stuff of that nature. Yeah. So I'm go. I have four, mm-hmm. the main four acting categories for my Midsummer Oscars, our Academy Award predictions. Best actor. I have seen it. It comes out first week end of August. Go see it. You will be blown away. I saw it three weeks ago. Sing Sing. I got an early access screen to it. Coleman Domingo, I think, has already won the award. Mm. The sheer range, that's going to be a performance we studied for its delicacy and its ferocity at the same time. Yeah. Sing Sing, Coleman Domingo. I think he wins the award. I'm going to go ahead and say it now before I even see all the performances. I said that last year with Downey Jr. when I walked out of Oppenheimer. I ended up thinking that Gosling and Ruffalo had better performances for Poor Things and Barbie, respectively. Mm-hmm. But sometimes you just know. You see the one scene and you know. For for Oppenheimer, it was the, I know J. Robert Oppenheimer. If he could do it all over again, he would. Uh, scene when Strauss realizes he doesn't have the votes. That scene alone won down in the yeah. Oscar. The yeah. I think second is going to be Daniel Craig. Mm. That's fair. Um, Queer doesn't have a distributor yet, which is interesting, but it also hasn't had a festival released yet. So yeah. that's usually where you get picked up by a distributor. There's been a lot of buzz about this movie, about the content of the movie. And I think that the Academy 
has been looking for a reason to nominate Daniel Craig for many, many years. So now that he's out of the bond, mm. I think we'll see it. We'll, I think he's well liked enough that uh, he'll, he's a lock to yeah. get nominated. The third, and I don't know which movie this is going to be because the second half of this movie, once he flips the switch, he's one of the best acting performances I've ever seen. Timothy Chalamet in Dune 2. Yes, but I was going to say. More up the alley of what the Academy likes to award is a complete unknown where he plays Bob Dylan, which drops this winner. Mm-hmm. So he, we may see a situation. Remember in 2006 when Leonardo DiCaprio was nominated for an Academy Award? Or uh, 2007? Yeah. For, for a movie that came out in 2006, and it wasn't The Departed. Yeah. <laughs> I I think we'll see that situation again, because he was up for Blood Diamond, even though his Departed performance yeah. was better. The I, We don't get that very often, but sometimes it happens where people have two roles that can be nominated. The I think Timothy Chalamet is a lock. I just don't know which – I'm not confident on which movie I'm going to have to see how the Bob Dylan bio, biopic goes before mm-hmm. – I'm confident on that being the one. Um, but if it's not, then Dune 2 is definitely getting nominated. Ralph Fiennes, I think they've been looking for a reason to nominate him since The English Patient, and that was 30 years ago now, give or yeah. take a couple years. Uh, that was 97, so 27 years ago. Uh, Conclave is getting a lot of uh, buzz, um, and that's going to be a major awards contender. And then... Paul Mescal, I think they're going to do category fraud and put him as the. Um, yeah. I don't think there's a clear cut as well. of Gladiator 2, and he's been getting the most buzz so far. So I'm yeah. going to go ahead and say they're going to position him as the leading man the same way that Apple did last year with Lily Gladstone for Killers, even though she yeah. was not a lead actress in that movie. <laughs> I, the, I agree. Yeah, I agree with you with Paul Mescal a lot. Paul Mescal, for people who aren't really as familiar with him, is I think this will be his very his big transition into the top echelon of Hollywood, if you get me. He's kind of been slowly making his way up. He's been in more movies and so on. Obviously, being Irish, I was introduced to him with Normal People, which is a great show if you haven't seen it for anyone who's watched it. But I think he's going to get a launch off this that is going to put him into top, that top echelon. And I agree that he probably will be nominated if the script is as good as people are hyping it up to be. If he has I don't script, expect Gladiator to be good, but that's a different conversation. Yeah, that's true. Um, but I, I assume you're – were you finished with – your best actor there you that's that's the best actor nominations i have three more categories uh just to add like one more um it's i'm not sure when it comes out but here with tom hanks could be a movie that could be kind of a sleeper pick for that category hanks as usual hanks is hanks if he has the right script i think he could definitely the academy loves tom hanks he's one of the few actors to win two years in a row yeah, and, uh, Philadelphia and uh, Forrest Gump. I love Tom Hanks. He's one of my favorite actors of all time. I don't think that movie looks good, mm. which is kind of why I left him off. Yeah, I think uh, I think yeah. Tom Hanks is an easy. Uh, we yeah. don't have anybody else to nominate. Let's yeah, let's go <laughs> um, especially since his his performances as of late have been really good. A Man Called Otto from 2022 was a Fantastic. stellar Tom Hanks performance fantastic movie very very wholesome he, they like to nominate tom hanks he's one of the most nominated actors of all time so just like last year for best supporting actor robert de niro and i love de niro so i'm not trying to criticize de niro should not have been up for that award last year but it's easy to go hey let's just give de niro a nomination because the academy loves him and yeah he's established so i could see tom hanks getting a best actor now in the same way I just think it's a little too strong of competition. And there's a couple other names I left off mm-hmm. that I would put before Tom Hanks. Yeah. The, I mentioned Paul Mescal as category fraud. And I think they're going to do category fraud and best supporting actor too. Probably. Because I think Kieran Culkin is going to be the lead and a real pain. But I think because, I, I don't think there's any way since he's co-lead, I think they're going to run him as support campaign. 
mm-hmm. because the Academy is not going to give a nomination to a, t- a child star who became a TV actor. Yeah. That's never been nominated before. That's just how it is. Kieran Culkin's an outstanding actor, and anybody who's seen Succession knows that. But I don't, he needs to establish himself as a lead before they give him a lead act, actor role, actor nom. I think he's going to be up for best supporting actor. But I think Sing Sing's going to be a real awards contender. Clarence Macklin, do you know who that is? I don't off the top of my head, I'll be completely honest. Clarence Macklin, I think, I think has a real shot at winning. First time acting role, just got out of prison. Sing Sing is about Sing Sing Penitentiary and how they they used acting to rehabilitate the men in there and build their communication so when they got out, they'd be better citizens. Outside of Coleman Domingo, the entire cast is the people that were in the Sing Sing theater department. And yeah. the, the second secondary lead is Clarence Macklin in his first movie role. And he steals the show. And I think between his performance and with the story of look at how he rehabilitated himself because the Academy loves narratives. I think we could see somebody win for their first role. And I don't know how often it's been done. I know Goldie Hawn did it for Cactus Flower yeah. in 69. Um, she won Best Supporting Actress in her first movie role. Uh, and then and never got nominated again, which is a real shame because she's a tremendous actress. But I know it's not unprecedented. Um, the, young, the youngest uh, winner of all time is... Uh, I can't think of her name right now. She won for... Um, in 1972. Um, her dad was, her dad was uh, in the movie with her. I can't... Um, Ryan O'Neill's daughter won, won when she was like seven. Tatum O'Neill is her name. Um, yeah. For her performance in Paper Moon. Um, so she won in her debut role. So there's at least two off the top of my head. She also never got nominated again as far as I know. Yeah. Um, the So it's not necessarily unprecedented, but it doesn't happen very often. And if the two examples I can think of, I have to go back to the late to the early 70s, late 60s. Yeah. Then it hasn't happened in a minute. The I did you you saw the bike riders, right? I haven't seen it yet. But I, I well, think I think I'll have to wait till it's on digital now. But I've I know enough about the hype to know that Tom Hardy is definitely gonna be a contender. He's your favorite actor, isn't he? He's not my favorite actor. I don't really. I I wouldn't say at this point in time I have a favorite actor, but he's definitely one that I enjoy a lot. And I think it's really hard for him to get a role that he can't play significantly well. I think, I think that kind of role, the kind of dark, not 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 dark, but kind of grounded in reality, a deep reality like the bike riders is. Uh, I, that's I haven't seen it now, but that's what I've I've seen from reviews and from just just the general vibe from trailers and so on. So I can see him definitely. Like I agree with you that I can see him definitely getting nominated for that. Um, of movies that have released to the general yeah. public this year, that's the only supporting actor. Yeah. Of general releases so far, I have for my five. Yeah. If I, I if I could add some support and actors to this uh, to be honest i still have this... two more oh sorry go on <laughs> you were a big game of thrones fan right a big what game of thrones fan right big yes uh, i watched it all in like a ridiculous time frame to get would you say uh season. oberyn had the worst death on the show Depends if you mean violent or if you mean um, like worst as in like br- I don't I don't know to be honest. There's a couple of brutal deaths, but it's definitely top three. I'd say top so three. So I'm gonna put the okay. actor who plays him, Pedro, in the conversation. Pedro Pascal. I yeah. think they've been looking for a reason to nominate him. I think he's one of the biggest actors on the planet right now. I think the hype and the campaign narrative carries him over for Gladiator Two. Yeah. I think, and I think his Gladiator 2, also Equalizer 2, 
for some reason they like to do sequels together. Co-star Denzel Washington. The uh, for the same reason you say Tom Hanks, I'm putting Denzel on there. And Denzel always um, delivers a uh, yeah. more than quality performance. So I'm I. I don't know if I'm confident in that pick, but I know Denzel is going to deliver. And I know the Academy likes to nominate him. So that, that rounds out my nom- I, nominee predictions. For that. I agree. I agree with pretty much all of them, really. I, Denzel, especially. I, I'm very much looking forward to seeing how the stars of Gladiator 2 do like uh, mesh. There, there's, there's a couple of different actors like that I haven't really seen work together before. So like Denzel and... Uh, Pedro, I'm not sure if they have worked together before, but we're going to see them work together. I have. Was... Equalizer 2. Oh, yeah, you just mentioned it. Oh, uh, but Paul Mescal, like I said, is an up-and-coming actor that I think is someone, well, not up-and-coming, but he's an actor that this is really going to really launch him. And I really do think that the supporting cast is going to be very pivotal in that. Because, like you said, there's so, there's there's a couple of actors in the background that could be nominated for supporting. But I also would say that... Um, we live in time. Andrew Garfield might end up getting nominated because he's. He, it's. Uh, Would that Florence be as a lead or as a? As a supporting because uh, Florence Pugh is supposed to be the main lead in that movie, so I imagine she'd get nominated for a best actress. I don't think she'd be a supporting. He's actress. on my list for best actress. I'll tell you that. Yeah, and I think also it's a kind of a, a sneaky pick kind of uh, Chris Hemsworth and Furiosa could, I think could be a possibility. I thought he was fantastic. No, because that's not the kind of performance they award, but he was exceptional in that movie. I, I, I get that, but I think there was a very a, a deeper, there was, there was the deeper kind of meaning behind this character that he invoked that kind of makes me think the Academy might have another look at that kind of role. I know, I know, I understand what you're saying. It's not that kind of role that usually would be nominated, but I think if you're looking at Furiosa, I think Furiosa sh- should have a couple of nominations. We don't know. We pr- They probably won't have in the fields that they should. And this is one of those examples, but I think it, it, I, you have to mention Hemsworth at least in this discussion because he was the, I, I think he was the, the best acting in that movie. Anya, I Anya, was, Anya was fantastic. I loved and Anya in that movie. Actually carries me into best actress because I think Anya Taylor Joy is gonna be my biggest snub. The yeah. sheer volume of dialogue she has is very, very little. It's non-existent. And she tells the entirety of the story where I through her facial expressions while wearing face paint. Yep. The sheer acting prowess that the role that the role demanded for Anya Taylor Joy, as entertaining as Chris Hemsworth is, is harder than anything Chris Hemsworth yeah. had to do in that movie. Oh, oh and absolutely, while, yeah. And while it's not a role that they're going to nominate, I I have to give Anya Taylor uh, Joy a shout in that. Yeah, she was outstanding, but she's not going to get nominated, so she's not on my prediction list. My prediction list. Has no move for best actress. Has no movie that's out yet. I uh, yeah, I have, a, I have a couple from that that aren't out yet. Well, I've won from. Uh, so there's movies. a lot of guesswork here. I'm gonna say Social Ronin's winning. Yep. Thank you. I was about. I was gonna say that. I think no matter what happens, she's winning. She has two awesome Oscar. Just the, the exact kind of movies they're looking for, and she's going to be. And it could be movie. either movie. And yeah. she's going to deliver a good performance. It's a week. It's a week here, and the main front runner is Mikey Madison for Anora, who is mm-hmm. on my prediction list. But yeah. they don't usually like to award uh, actors in their fir- in their first big breakout role, and I and especially especially best actress. It's hard. It's hard to win when you're breaking out. So I think Saoirse Ronan. It would be her fifth Oscar nom. And they've wanted to give it to her four times, and something's just been better four times. Yeah. So I think I think in a week here, this is when the Academy finally gives it to her. Long over. Um, I think. And I'm okay with that. I don't really need to see the movies to know that Saoirse Ronan is deserving of an Oscar win. Oscar yeah. win. She knocks the, everything out of the park. Like the I, only I, reason she gets the career win, and not the next person, is because the next person got the career win in 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 their fifth nomination. And I think they're going to get their sixth nomination, if you know who I'm talking about. Florence, perhaps. 
No. Florence Pugh does not have an Oscar, nor does she have five nominations. I'm not sure then, honestly. I'm, okay, I'm, just I'm not. I'm not as, I'm, sorry, I, I'm just not as well versed with the Oscars and so on. Like I know mm-hmm. the big ones, but sometimes I do miss uh, who wins them. So she won for Still Alice in 2015. Probably should have won Best Support in '98 for Boogie Nights. Who did she even lose to? I'm gonna look look at that real quick. Who won Best Supporting Actress in '98? Good Kim call. Basinger for LA Confidential. That's not better than Julia Moore in Boogie Nights. I'm sorry. Julia Moore. She should have won for the hours for Best Supporting Actress in 03. But Julia Moore is getting a lot of buzz again. Mm-hmm. Should have been nominated last year. They didn't nominate her last year. Um, probably should have been nominated over Jodie Foster, but Jodie Foster had a big comeback narrative The uh, for Best Supporting, uh, for Best Actress. The Echo Valley... And the room next door are both supposed to be big upcoming movies. Um, Echo Valley is going to have Apple behind it, and I think the room next door has A twenty four behind it. Those are always oh no, uh, room next door has Warner Bros behind it. Control yeah. is the one with A twenty four behind it. E- either way, those three studios are always huge monsters for acting awards yeah the academy's proven with five nominations at the end of career win already they love julian moore julian moore is awesome one of my favorite actresses of all yeah. time i'm okay with that so i think julian moore has more more than enough to no pun intended more than enough to carry her over i think she gets nomination i think her still alice win is the difference maker to give social road in the win yeah, because I, think, I don't, I don't think she gets the career win over more if more if more doesn't have one. Yeah, I agree with you there. I really like for um, actress. I think Sersha is pretty much a guarantee. Like I said, she has two really uh, like we don't. I don't like to use the phrase Oscar bait. I think but it's like, gonna be Blitz. I think she's think, nominated for Blitz. I think Blitz is dependent on a couple of things because. World War Two movies can be hit or miss. I feel like World War One movies are usually oh no, World War One movies I think are usually always hits, but World War Two movies is a even more of a sen- more sensitive kind of dynamic because of just the how much bigger on the world stage it was. But that's the thing with Blitz; it's condensed to London. It's it's condensed to London during the Blitz, and obviously for me being an Irish person and you being from the US, I. I know so much about the Blitz and so on and so forth. It's a very, very, very like 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 we've been saying, it's an Oscar bait. But I think the part her other role, uh the Outrunner, I believe is it the Outrunner is the title. I could be wrong there. Probably. The Outrun. The Outrun. Sorry, I was thinking of the AEW wrestlers. Um yeah, it's, I think you were thinking true Magnum. <laughs> Well, I think I think the outrun is gonna is probably gonna be her better role because that's that's where she thrives, Saoirse. Saoirse thrives in that role. Lady Bird is probably one of my favorite performances by an actress in any movie. Any and that's movie. That's my favorite social role. I know, but that's the thing as well about Saoirse. Yeah, she has so many movies that she's been fantastic in. That's Little not Women. even my. Favorite Sorsha A24 Greta Gerwig role. <laughs> and that's fair because she has so many good roles. But I think you left off one person. Well, actually, I'm, no. It depends. Uh, who's, who's one more? Because you Florence. might end up. Oh, I mentioned Florence Pugh earlier. I think Florence Pugh's going to get on. But Angelina Jolie for Maria. Uh, uh, Academy loves their biopics week year. They love Angelina Jolie. Uh, there's one person I did leave off that people are going to be mad I left off, so I'm going to see if that's who you're talking about. Who? Amy Adams. Oh, I wasn't going to say Amy Adams. I was go- but I, I might be defining um, act like lead, as a lead wrong, but that was my right. like feeling out with Dune 2 was Zendaya was almost on the same level as Timothy as terms of leads See, and lead i didn't i didn't like zendaya's dune 2 performance but i loved her challenges performance that's fair but i i, I think that dune 2 is probably going to have a couple of nominations that are gonna kind of 
We'll get there with I, Best Supporting Actress. Yeah, but... <laughs> the, the, so, obviously, it's not so much P because you can't be nominated in two categories in a year. But the... Uh, the Angelina Jolie is getting a lot of Oscar buzz for Night Bitch, mm. where she turns into a dog. A horror movie where she goes turns into a dog is people wanting it wanting it to be nominated solely because they want Amy Adams to win an award because they think she's overdue. And she's a good actress, but she's not had every t- every year she lost there was somebody better. So I don't necessarily think she's overdue. But yeah. the, if the Academy is not going to give Tony Collette a nomination for Hereditary, they're not going to give somebody a nomination for a movie from called Night Bitch. Yeah, I think that's. I think as well. Um, obviously, haven't seen it myself. You have seen it. Uh, the sorry, I can't remember her name, but the lead in Long Legs, she would probably be a contender. Michael I Monroe? imagine. I imagine she would be a contender if the Academy wasn't such. Uh, and of course, um, yeah, uh, Michael Monroe is excellent in that movie. Alicia Witt would be a contender for best supporting actress if they, if if they would award Long Legs, but they're yeah. not going to. Uh, but yeah, that's something that we can talk about maybe another time about how horror kind of gets dismissed by the Oscars. But will we move on to your next category and then my final category? I mentioned Dune too, so I, be- I better stay out of the gate. You know who I want to see win the award? That's not going to because Lady who? Gaga is winning it, which I'm okay with. Who? Rebecca Ferguson. Good call. Good for call. me. She's she's the best at she's the best performance in Dune too, yeah. and might be the best pre- supporting performance of the year so far. Yeah. Oh, she yeah. is the best supporting performance of the year so far. There's a there's the, yeah. For me, she made that movie. The um. The this one's kind of a wild card because Khan's best actress this year. Went to four women for one movie. Yeah. Amelia Perez. They're all co leads. So they all got best actress because they all supposedly had career best performances. So I'm putting Selena Gomez and Zoe Saldana in there. I'm, I have, a, when, when you have finished your list, I have one that you probably will disagree with, but I, I think it's a fair one. But, but continue. I just I have Ellie Fanning for a complete unknown. Yeah. And my winner and final nominee is Lady Gaga. I think Gaga probably should have won in 2018, though I'm fine with Olivia Coleman or 2019, though I'm fine with Olivia Coleman having beat her because it got Olivia Coleman a lot more roles and Olivia Coleman is awesome. Yeah. So I'm glad Olivia Coleman got established in Hollywood instead of giving the most famous pop star on the planet at the time the award. But Lady Gaga has proven she's a phenomenal actress. Yeah. I think Joker 2, Fale Adu is going to make get a lot of buzz. And I don't think there's really a clear front runner for this award. Doesn't so I think Lady like I it. think I think this propels Lady Gaga, even though a star is born should have done it, firmly yeah. entrenched into Hollywood. The uh, best supporting actress is difficult because I know she ne- she'd never get nominated, but I really want to see Jodie Comer get nominated for Bike Riders. I thought she was terrific. Uh, and then there's kind there's two veterans who are kind of a wild card: Carol yeah. Kane and her upcoming Jason Schwartzman movie. Mm-hmm. Um, Carol Kane, I love Carol Kane. It would be insane to see her get an Oscar now. My favorite scene in the movie history is when she hits Bill Murray with the toaster and screws. So I'm a Carol Kane fan. But the uh, I think Isabella Rossellini for Conclave uh, could, could get a Here's a Great Career Award. She should have been nominated for Blue Velvet, but she's ne- uh, never been nominated. The Academy loves her, and that's going to be an award powerhouse. Mm-hmm. So I fully, I expect that to be in the best picture conversation. Well, Fiennes, I already mentioned. So I, I, I could see her getting an outside shot at a nomination. Yeah. Uh, who, who, who was your snub? That uh, I didn't 
I think it's a snub, and I think it's probably a snub that you will disagree with. But Freya Allen, for me, is someone that I think is deserving of admit, at least a nomination. Because here for Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes, and oh, here's my wow. reason why. She's here's, excellent, but no. Uh, the reason why I say that, and it's it's I think it's a problem really with that franchise and over reliance on CGI in these franchises because they don't want they want to give these movies these awards for visual effects so they feel like they can't give them the awards for their acting and so on but Freya in a movie which is she has only one other human that she interacts with in that movie one or well one until the end the entire plot of that movie she is in acting with CGI characters and people who are all in the, the motion cap. And I think she is absolutely phenomenal in a way that is almost sinister. I think she's a very sinister character. And I think that she does a fantastic job of conveying that. But I do understand why you wouldn't really consider her. I think it. she's scintillating. I think the before she speaks in the movie, when she is uncomfortable around the apes and she's crawling on the floor trying to get on the ground trying to get food master class in acting so i have nothing against the performance i thought it was a terrific performance yeah i think that's more of a conversation which we'll have at a later date about how the academy doesn't respect how hard it is to act with in front of a screen the idea that it's easier to act in front of a screen is wrong yeah because you have nothing to bounce off of you can't put yourself into the situation and see what the character is supposed to see which yeah. makes it harder to convey emotion and respond how they you think that the character should respond i'm yeah. tired of people judging actors because they're in front of a screen it's like have you ever heard the story of brad pitt on friends yeah how it was brad like pitt brad pitt didn't didn't think it would thought TV was gonna be easy. He comes on Friends. Has a great performance, by the way. Screw it, yams. I love that performance. She also made that with second guy get the moment morning before he went back to the. That performance is hilarious. Mm-hmm. My two biggest enemies, Ross, Rachel Green and Complex Carbohydrates. Like that's one of Brad Pitt's best performances, and I'm a Brad Pitt fan. Yeah. The but he he mentioned the the first thing he did was apologize to Jennifer Aniston after because he kind of looked down on TV and then he realized performing in front of a live audience is hard because you have to pause every time you deliver something because the you have to wait to the eyes for to react and you have to react to their reaction and actors don't people that aren't in the industry don't realize how hard it is to go from different mediums and different type of actings in different situations. Yeah. And I think that, I think that's a good example in another way. You don't realize how hard it is to react to something. And to, so there's nothing to react to. Yeah. If that makes sense. Oh no, absolutely. And that was kind of, that was my point as well. Like it's just it's just such a phenomenal performance when you factor that in, when you really think about that. And and yes, there's they've come a long way in the fact that motion cap is a lot more hands-on. The actors are able to do a lot more that they can just CGI over in a realistic way. But at the end of the day, Kingdom is the one with the least amount of humans in the movie so far in that the- franchise. And she's the, probably the best performance in the entire franchise from a hum, from a human character. Andy Serkis never getting nominated for Caesar is a disgrace, but that's he for another have. day. That's for another and, day. And, Andy Serkis should have been nominated for, uh, for 13 going on 30. I would be taking no questions at this time. <laughs> that was not a serious joke, by the way, though he is great in that movie. The uh, I th- I, That's him, right? He plays Jennifer yeah. Garner's boss. Yeah. Okay. Um, the uh, the we're gonna anything else you want to add about performances you no. think could be nominated? No, but we'll uh, hit we'll hit this again in January when the short list of nominees get announced. Yeah. The 
because we're, we're, we're at the 50 minute mark. We got to move on. We got two more things to talk about. The next little thing won't take us more than five minutes. And then we're yep. going to talk about Deadpool Wolverine. Yes, sir. Uh, Van Mouder just... gave a very, very funny performance, but it was not as funny as Hugh Jackman. No, which is which is surprising. But in terms of movies coming up, we we obviously we are going to get to that. But movies coming up, guys. Uh, Borderlands in Ireland, at least, is coming out on the 9th of August. I'm not sure when that comes out in the US. Jamie, you Same would know But you go Same ahead and talk about it. You have a lot more to say about it than I do. Uh, Borderlands is something that falls into a, a a category of movies that I don't trust in video game movies. I think video game movies are a very, very hard medium to get right. It's a very fine line to walk between a tra- traditional adaptation and making your own piece of art based on the characters created in that video game. We saw it with Gran Turismo. We saw it with, um, with a couple of other movies over the oh, last few years. Yep, yeah, that have got it right in a positive way. They've, they've put their own spin on it, but they have remained faithful to the original adaptation. I'm very concerned with Borderlands because Borderlands is a very, very like th- this is not a concept I think you can tra- transition faithfully into cinema. Do I do I think you could make a TV show about Borderlands? Absolutely, but and they're condens- very different mediums, people. Trust yeah. me. Yeah, and condensing everything about the Borderlands universe, which is so chaotic, so anarchist, it's post-apocalyptic. It's there's so much world building that needs to be done in that video game. Playing that game as someone who's played it, it is a lot of world building. There's a lot of exposition that needs to be done for you to really understand what is going on in that universe. I don't think they will have time to do that in this movie. I think they will skim over some very important parts. They leave some things out. They do their own spin, and the cast does not make me light me up with excitement or with general kind of oh the cast to make it work because the cast is not the kind of cast I would have in a Borderlands movie. Kate Blanchett is is fantastic. She is a fantastic actress. Jamie Lee Curtis is a fantastic actress. I was going to mention her. Jack Black, when he wants to be, is a fantastic actor. Kevin Hart is not a good actor. Funny comedian, (laughs) bad actor. He's a bad actor. His comedy works in stand-up. His comedy does not work in cinema. I will say that forever. I don't trust him in this movie. I don't trust him to be able to convey the satirical nature of this. At the end of the day, Borderlands is out there. It's almost like a comic book. That's what that universe is like. So I'm concerned that they're not going to take it seriously enough. Uh, Eli Roth is a great uh, director. He's perfect for it. Lionscape being the distributor and the company behind it is great as well. I hope I'm wrong. I really do hope I'm wrong and the movie is fun. But I'm not going into it with a lot of hope. The trailers don't give me a lot of hope. The the, uh, marketing doesn't give me a lot of hope. I will admit that the costumes, the the wardrobe and everything, all that looks great. No notes on that. Just It just doesn't really light me up with much interest. I don't know how much interest you have in it, but that's my opinion on that. I, I was looking at the cast this morning. I didn't realize Jamie Lee Curtis was there, which is yeah. really weird. But right now, she's doing the best work of her career. Absolutely. The thing about Jamie Lee Curtis, yeah. Knives what? Out was was she was outstanding in. Then she did everything ever all at once. The, we, the two best episodes I've seen of T television I've seen this decade, maybe in my life, are Fishes, which Jamie Lee Curtis has an hour long mental breakdown in mm-hmm. of the bear, and the episode of the bear from the last season where spoilers ahead. Um, Abby Elliott gives birth and Jamie Lee Curtis, who doesn't have a relationship with her daughter is the last is the only person who's able to get there. So she has to go through this experience with her daughter to get together while yeah. also going through working through their issues. And she's just on another level of acting right now. That makes me really interested that she's doing a video game movie at this point. Yeah. Her. But the thing um, is, is she can play that kind of wacky side, though. 
she's very good at that and i don't know if that's her, from her experience on the halloween franchise or what but when she gets the chance to play kind of a silly role she's actually quite good and she's very endearing in that role jamie lee curtis like she, she can definitely do that role i just don't i trust her i tr like i said i trust her i trust kate blanchett i just i'm not sure about the rest i'm not either um who else is in the cast? I'm going to look at this real quick. Let's see. Other than Kevin Hart, because we agree he's not a good actor. Jack Black um, is, but... I, I, I disagree, but I'm, I've never been a big Jack Black fan. But his is a voice role, and he's always been a good yeah. voice guy. Uh, yeah. Zeke in Ice Age, Poe in Kung Fu Panda, uh, Lenny in Shark Tale. He's a very good voice guy, so that yeah. really fits him well. Gina Jershon's in it. I think she's very underrated. Um, my, my one thing. Like on Thanksgiving, Pretty in Pink, the player. Uh, she's had an under, under the radar. Nice career. Yeah. It's an interesting cast. I, um, I think Jack Black's role is very important. I think he's, he's really the glue. The whole, his role is the glue that pulls the entire universe together. He's playing Claptrap. If you don't know who Claptrap is, he is literally your entire exposition dump in a character. He's your tutorial in the games. He's your best friend in the games. He's your accomplice. He's the person who's going to be responsible for doing the world building. And Jack Black is, as we know, very funny actor. So I'm very voice actor. So I'm looking forward to seeing how he does that. But he is very important in this movie. So hopefully he can nail that. The um, so I have a couple of things coming out. Do you notice horror fans have been eating really well recently? Yeah, there's been a couple of really good horror movies this year. Even in the last month alone, fan. in the last yeah. month alone, we've got Quiet Place Day One, Maxine, Oddity, Oddity was exceptional, um, Long Legs. We also got The Beast Within, which I saw this past weekend. Not a good movie, so I'm not counting that. But over the next three weeks, this weekend, we have Trap. Going to see yeah. it Thursday. The new M. Night Shyamalan movie starring Josh Hartnett. Cannot the, wait. The premise looks interesting, but it kind of depends on how good the acting is. That's going to be a movie made or break with its acting. It's also a movie that's going to make or break with the second twist. Because you know M. Night Shyamalan isn't going to give you the big twist out of the gate in the trailer. He's got another right. one set up, ready to go. So I think that's going to be one that's going to be uh, really important to that movie. I'm looking forward to that movie as well, though. And anything but Shyamalan really is something that kind of catches my attention. Because he really does go out all above and beyond with his out there plots. So that, that should be a fun one. The... The week after, oh, we have something the week after. I th the week Alien. after is Alien Romulus. Which looks really good and looks like and very that, much like it's going back to its roots. So that takes place in between the original Ridley Scott movie, which I talked about last week, and the uh, James Cameron sequel, Aliens. Yeah. Canonically, it takes place in between the two. And apparently takes a lot from the two. Obviously, from the trailer, it takes the heart spot where it comes yeah. out of the chest from the first one. So I'm very interested to see how that is. I'm excited for it. And then the week after that, no, that Ellie Romulus is in two weeks. Pardon me. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously. The next week's a uh, week a week from Thursdays is Cuckoo with Hunter Schaefer. Yes. And that looks really good. So I'm, I'm very really excited about that. I'm really enjoying the movies that Hunter Schaefer is like putting out. Like she really is putting out some like really fun movies and especially horror. Like she has been dipping into more and more horror and she's been knocking out of the park with the movies. Like and I'm looking forward to this as well. Like Cuckoo is just I saw the trailer for Cuckoo a couple of weeks ago and I hadn't seen any promotion for it or anything like that until I saw the trailer. So I, I'm probably going to try to find time to see that as well, but I think it'll be a very fun movie. 
the um, – so, yeah, horror fans are doing well. Other than that, I kind of have an issue with uh, at least here in the States, the theaters right now, because a lot of the theaters are ta- – uh, Disney is ta- – between two movies is taking up over 50% of the theaters. Twisters yeah. is taking up another big portion. And the rest are kind of being taken up by the Olympics, which are playing at AMCs, which is our big theater chain. Yeah. The I know y'all don't have AMCs there, but we have a couple yeah. of we have a couple of movies coming out in August that that I do want to have a just a quick mention of because like obviously they're not they're not they're not gonna be as popular in the States, but one that you didn't mention that was surprised is the Crow, the new Crow movie. I'm that's not excited for that. Week. I think it not looks horrible. Well, that's well. Either way, that is coming out, guys. If you didn't know, that is coming out next month. Um, and a movie that I have to mention as an Irish person. Um, if you are Irish, you've probably seen the trailers for this. The Mark and Mike kneecaps. Kneecap looks very fun. That's it looks playing, very fun. Uh, that comes out next week here. If if it, oh, it's coming out in the states. I didn't know that yeah. was coming out in the states. So. Definitely, if you if you can get to see it, guys, it does look like a very very fun movie. It's very much an Irish and um, a very 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 Irish movie, even though it's based in Northern Ireland, I believe. But uh, it's very much uh, uh, a time capsule kind of movie about the troubles and about the IRA and so on, and the background of that in Ireland. So it does look like a very funny movie as well. So I definitely go and see that, guys. If it is shown near you, that is a fun one. Um, but yeah, I agree with you. There's not really anything else uh, major coming the, out other than that. One thing I will say I'm excited for is we, at least here, we are getting an Everything Everywhere All at Once IMAX re-release next month. We're, we're getting uh, Spider-Man. And we are getting the Dolby, uh, Dolby version of uh, Shaun of the Dead for its 20th anniversary. That's awesome. That's awesome. I'm, 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 I'm going to go see both because I, I haven't seen either in theaters yet. So I, uh, always, always good re-releases to look out for the um, right. Like uh, we're getting eighth grade re-released um, and mid nineties. I haven't seen, I haven't seen either of those movies. I'm a big age 24 fan. So I'll go to those re-releases too. Might as well see them for the first time in theaters. Um, don't know, you know if what I mean? Getting them, but for uh, what is it? Is it Columbia's hundred anniversary? This, all the Spider-Man movies are coming in one by one throughout the month. That already month. happened in the states. Oh, that's well, that's happening in Ireland between uh, August and September, which is probably a good time for him to come because Deadpool and Wolverine just came out. You're going to have a lot of people wanting to go and go and see Marvel properties. There is no big Marvel properties coming out anytime soon, that I believe. Uh, so we we have some time. So it's probably a good good business move to release uh, at least over here after the success of Deadpool and Wolverine. But I don't think there's anything else really major coming out until September. And then we've got the likes of Beetlejuice and uh, Speak No Evil. Uh, if I see the trailer where the kid does the Cotton Eye Joe wrong one more time, I'm refusing to see that movie out of principle. We mentioned the Outrun that's coming out in September as well. And there, there's not really much else coming out in September. The Salem's Lot remake is coming out in September. Or in October, sorry. Uh, Hellboy, The Crooked Man, which is actually filed under horror, according to IMDb, which is coming out uh, in September. Uh, there's not really much else coming out in September. There's Lee with uh, Alexander Skarsgård and Kate Winslet. But uh, yeah, it's kind of like you said, it's kind of a, a dip in releases period. But I think now we well, can... We do move. have big releases like Deadpool Wolverine. Yep, which we are going to transition into now. Uh, before we, we got five to... minutes before we go off air, so let's get through this. Five? No, we, we'll go. We'll go a small bit longer because we do. We will have a lot to talk about with this movie. But from and here, we have spoilers, people. We have spoilers from here. So if you did enjoy so far, guys, like, subscribe, come back when you have seen the movie because trust us, it is worth talking about. And, and make uh, sure to follow me on Twitter. I'm going to use just 2024 releases, whether they're out now or they're coming out for this. That's yeah. the Jameis, at the Jameis. That's J as in Joker Falandu, A as in Alien Romulus, M as in Maxine, which was should have done a lot better at the box office. I mean, E as in Amelia Perez, 
you as an upgrade. I couldn't really think of anything else. So there's a Camille Mendez Amazon Prime original. And S is in stop motion, a great shutter movie that got theatrical release this year. They've been killing they've been killing it with their theatrical releases. Stop motion, uh late night with the devil, uh in a violent nature, oddity, all the IFC shutter releases have been awesome this year. Anyway, that's yeah. at the Jameis on Twitter. <laughs> So, like we said at the top of the episode, guys, Deadpool and Wolverine has been mega money at the box office. It's already pulled in close to 300 million domestic, and it has pulled in over 500 million worldwide at the box office. That's in four days. Yep. It's averaging over 100 million a day worldwide right now. And I think it's the biggest example that we've had that superhero fatigue is a myth. Okay, we need to talk about that first. That is a myth. It goes, it goes back to what superhero it, fatigue. It goes back to what I was talking about last week. Everybody says they want to want to show over see original movies, and then they go see IP instead, which yeah. I'm okay with. I thought Deadpool and Wolverine was great. Uh, I went with somebody who doesn't watch superhero movies, whose funniest movie he's ever seen has been the same literally the entirety of my life. And he walked out saying that was the funniest movie he'd ever seen. And he started watching X-Men. Yeah. Because he doesn't watch superhero movies, so he never saw the X-Men movies. And seeing a casual, someone who's not into Marvel, enjoy it that much was awesome. Mm -hmm. Um, But that movie was great. I I didn't love it that much, but I thought it was a good 4.5 out of 5, which is very high. It just wasn't the funniest movie I've ever seen. The... The Deadpool, the Ryan Reynolds stick specifically works only for Deadpool for me, but yeah. it always works with Deadpool. Doesn't and it got Deadpool. made even better. Made even better by the fact that Hugh Jackman didn't put any of it over. He played it very straight, like Leslie Nielsen would, you know? Or or uh, Liam Neeson. Like, you know how Liam Neeson plays, plays it straight when he's looking at Ted and it makes Ted stick so much funnier? That's anyway. basically what Wolverine means to Deadpool. I ch- I heard this is for kids, <laughs> and Ted's like, "Yep." <laughs> just that kind of it. Just it's like he almost doesn't belong in a movie with Deadpool. And I do want to say what right now the scene where they're in the car, and Wolverine just he's done, and he's go and he just goes on that monologue of just. It's one of, and it's God's biggest joke that you can't die. And he just punches the, the top of the car. Hugh Jackman, man, that scene does not belong in He's that a movie. Stellar actor. That and song, he, that that scene does just does not belong, but it does. And then thing about that scene, funny one was one of the funniest things that made me laugh the most was when the next morning comes and and Deadpool is tied up in the seatbelt. <laughs> Just across his mouth, everything, and it's just like it, it was. It was just the fact that, and and literally, you feel bad for Deadpool. I didn't know that was possible to feel bad for that character because literally, just like you, and that's the thing. Ryan Reynolds, fair play, just on his body language, you obviously can't see Deadpool's face, but just the way his head drops, his his shoulders drop, it's it's great work, and you feel bad, and then just capped off with. I'm going to fight you now. And they just, the, exactly the fight you want to see between the two guys. The thing that I want to say about fight. that movie is we need to stop the cameo discourse. Chris Evans as, Fanta- with his Fantastic Four character, plays a pivotal part of that movie. So, so does Blade. Yours. So Electra. did everybody else. Those are not cameos. Those are support cast. Unannounced I support saw- cast. Yep. The only and I'm tired of it. Oh, be... oh, it's a it's a character that was announced. Oh, it's a cameo. A a cameo is what I can't think of his name. I can't Henry think Cavill. of his name. Pete, Pete, Pete. Well, yes, him too. But Pete from Friends. Uh, Pete from Friends, the actor. I can't remember. I I I don't. Hold John on. Favreau. Yeah. John Favreau at the beginning. He's in for one scene. Doesn't have many, many lines. That's barely a cameo. 
Yeah. Henry Cavill is the only true cameo in the movie. Fantastic cameo. I love that he did the Mission Impossible machine gun arms as well to set out the claws. That was fantastic. I th- I think we're I think we we're, I think we've gotten too far in the vernacular and using industry terms that we don't understand. Oh, I, I think we know another audience. Industry. I think we know another industry that's done that. <laughs> don't be a mark right now. <laughs> but people, it's, it's people who tell you that are the same people who think selling means good bumper. Where they're two very completely different things. Uh, I think one of the parts of the movie that really um, resonated with me is kind of just, just the fact that they they even had Wolverine pull over hood mask. That got a huge pop in my audience. I I didn't expect that at all. I did not expect them to put that mask on Hugh Jackman, and then he wears it for the rest of the goddamn movie. Which the, is uh, crazy to me. You know what my you know what excited me most in theater that should wow. have? At the very beginning of the opening credits, which was a very fun opening credits of sequence, by the way. Yeah, very the, funny. uh to the in sync. But the NSYNC. when Aaron Stanford's name popped up and Py- I realized Pyro was gonna be in it, I got I just started shaking because I was so excited. Yeah. I'm a big Aaron Stanford fan. I think he's very underrated. Uh, 12 he Monkeys is really when I became a big fan. You know Amanda Scholl, the chick from Suits, yeah. Katrina Bennett. Uh, he's him, him and her are It's the best sci-fi show I've ever seen and the best TV show of any genre in terms of attention to detail. So yeah. I, 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 remember, I binged that at the start of the pandemic right after I got done binging Suits. I've been telling you to watch it for four years now yeah um and so i've I, i've been hoping he gets more work so i'm hoping a good performance which i thought was a very good supporting performance can kind of get him back on hollywood's doorstep yeah because he's a very solid character actor yeah i i found that um it was very much, and I, Ryan Reynolds actually said this on social media. He said that it was just as much a tribute to the Fox universe as it was a debut to the Disney universe. It was, it and was, like, a bow. and I felt that. I definitely felt that in the movie. I like that of. because it delivered on a lot of things that we never got. Yeah. For example, I can't think of his name, but the, uh, uh, I, I'm just gonna look it up real quick. The original X movie. I, I'm yeah. going back to this. Um, yeah. Sabretooth. Sabretooth. They teased in that movie Sabretooth versus Wolverine. And then Sabretooth gets blasted out of the Statue of Liberty. Um, and decapitated. And then we don't, and then we ne- by James Bars did, and we never get the showdown between. Wolverine and Sabretooth. They didn't waste too much time on the showdown in Deadpool and Wolverine, but they at least gave you something to put a bow on that little uh, mini thread in the first X-Men movie. There so was, the yeah. fact that they wrapped up a lot of the things that Fox didn't wrap up, I thought was nice. Yeah. I... I found one of the best, one of the funny, well, not even the funniest, one of the funniest parts of the movie was when he was trying to find Wolverine, and right. it was the, it was when he landed in the universe where Wolverine was fighting Hulk. They 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 teased that, they teased that perfectly. Everyone when this movie was announced was like, "Oh my god, please put in Wolverine fighting Hulk, please put in Wolverine fighting Hulk." You see them both on screen. And, and then dead, it. but you get Deadpool evoking Loki from you'll Avengers. You'll get it later. You're definitely, you're definitely getting it later because they're not they're, with the with the money this movie just made. Hugh Jackman's coming back. Do you understand the comic book messiah? I am you, dirty. Poof, sends him flying into another universe. We go back to that later. Epic. I thought it was perfect. I thought that was even better than if we got it in the movie. I, I like that you mentioned Chris Evans because Chris Evans, you can tell, you can tell they said, 
you, you don't need to do anything. You, you don't need to train. You don't need to get in shape. And I guarantee you that man was like, thank well, God. He, he, he was pretty small in the fast yeah. fantastic four movies. Yeah, the, that's what he looked like. The thing about that surprise was everybody saw the red and they had kind of built up the Deadpool love, loves Captain America. I knew the moment I saw it wasn't Captain America, Same. but my entire yeah. audience fell for it. Yeah, and the she audible gasp when he did the the flame when he fired on. up, the when he flamed on. Woof! I was waiting for it. And I people, still love that. People, you could hear whispers in the theater. I forgot that was Chris Evans. That was before he got famous. Yeah, and that's what made it a good surprise because you saw Chris Evans and you still didn't see it coming. I I saw it coming because I knew it was coming. But speaking of Chris Evans. I have to mention it before I forget about it. The after credit scene is absolutely fantastic. It is one of the Were funniest- you saying all the things that Deadpool said he said? Yeah. Go on, I love Johnny. The, Go I, on. I love Say how you read it. With uh, Green Day. Yeah. I, I liked, like, that's the thing. I, and Deadpool. The definition of a crowd pleaser, which is exactly what it needed to be. It didn't need to be a bit of service. Everything was fan service in that movie. And I think it was fan service in the best way. I loved seeing Daniel Keane back. That was fantastic. Obviously, we've seen it in the trailer. Knowing she was coming back didn't lessen the emotional beat that they did where she revealed she was there. Because Wade made jokes. I, but she's not saw... on any movies after Logan. And I hope she gets something from this. She was fantastic in Logan. And that's something that I do want to talk about as well. Logan Emma Corrine was terrific too. Yeah. I think I think the whole cast was great in that movie, really. There was no I really think, a I performance think, I didn't like. I think in a couple months we should just do an episode on Wolverine in general. Yeah, I would love to because there's, Not there's right now, too much to unpack. But we can't uh, discuss Logan right now because we're 75 minutes into this and we don't want to be on for 90 again. So we'll 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 start we'll start wrapping up now. And so final thoughts on the movie. Uh, just just I'm just gonna really run through some final thoughts on it. Um, Deadpool was as ever hilarious. There wasn't I saw a lot of people being like, oh, he's he's supposed to be a conservative character and he's making jokes about woke virus and all that. He's it's the same as South Park. He mocks everybody. Get over it. Um, I love the intro, like you said, the intro to. Uh, Nobody yeah. gets offended more than a uh, conservative, conservative who pretends they don't get offended. Great marketing for the movie, though. Can't, can't complain. It's free marketing. Um, in terms of where I'd rank it in Marvel movies, I genuinely do not think there has been a Marvel movie that has come close to Endgame other than Spider-Man No Way Home. It's between Spider-Man No Way Home, Deadpool and Wolverine, and then there's a big gap between the rest, in my opinion. I like Guardians of the Galaxy 3, but it... it, it, it was disagree on that, but that's, it. again, don't got time for different. that. I'm, um, done. I'm done with my thoughts. Yeah. And final thoughts are Hugh Jackman should play Wolverine forever. That's all I'm going to say. Hugh uh, Jackman should play every character till the end of time. Yeah. Hugh Jackman's awesome. And we finished that up. I, I'd say, you said 4.5 out of 10, I'd say, or 4.5 out of 5, I'd say probably the same. That would probably be my ranking. I wouldn't give a full 5 either. Solely because it's a superhero movie, there's very few superhero movies I'd give a full 5 stars to. Um, it's called the entire Nolan Batman trilogy. Those all get yeah. 5 stars. Superman yeah. Donna gets 5 stars. Guardi, the first Guardians gets 5 stars. Um, yeah. I wouldn't uh, give there's a more. But there's more. There's more. Um, um, but yeah, we'll finish up now, guys. If you did enjoy, make sure to subscribe, like. Next week, I'm not sure what we'll be talking about. Probably wrestling movies, because that was the original plan for today until we both decided that we love Deadpool Wolverine. Um, make oh, sure we to gotta talk us. about a specific somebody in that. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> but as you guys can see, our social medias are on our overlay, who which was made by the awesome mike from indeed guys make sure to go follow him he is awesome you can follow me at court at cory brennan ff you can follow jamie at, at james i'm not gonna do the uh a That's word jay, for every layer. you're not doing jay, the jeff jay, jarrett jay. so stop 
<laughs> but yeah, guys, if you want us to cover... actually, it's more of a Phoebe thing, you know, that scene that's P is a Phoebe, H is a Phoebe, O is an OB, E is an EB, B is a BB, E is an hello there, mate. But yeah, guys, Jamie's humor is awful, but make sure to come back, he does have good thoughts occasionally. <laughs> Make sure to subscribe and uh, yeah, we'll see you guys in episode three next week. Deuces. <laughs>